Hey, 42 here. If you're watching this video, there's a 1 in 3 chance you're on the toilet. A 1 in 3 chance you're already reading the comments, and a 1 in 3 chance that you're eating something. And if you are eating, there's a 1 in 3 chance that bees played a part in producing it. In fact, bees are responsible for pollinating about 70% of all crops globally, and a third of all food consumed by humans. But if you're picturing vast commercial bee farms, you're a little off target. Most of the world's bees live in small, unassuming hives that dot the countryside seemingly at random. But make no mistake, these tiny colonies are the invisible laborers keeping the world fed. You see, pollination, the process by which plants reproduce, is a delicate business that requires a highly specialized and very precise pollinator. For many plants, that happens to be bees. Basically, bees help plants to have sex. They transfer pollen from the male parts of a flower to the female parts, so it can produce seeds and fruit. Some plants are self-pollinating, and some are wind-pollinated, but a sizable number aren't. Without bees, the world would starve. Bee pollination is so valuable the US government has a number for it. 15 billion dollars. That's the amount of money the US economy would lose every year if bees suddenly disappeared. And that's just the US. Globally, bee pollination is worth at least $150 billion a year. However, behind these staggering numbers is a staggeringly sad truth. The bees are disappearing, and at an alarming rate. It's been called colony collapse disorder. It sounds like a heavy metal band, but it's actually a distressing phenomenon, first noticed in 2006. Each year, beekeepers are reporting losses of roughly 30 to 45% of their colonies, and bees all over the world are now living half as long as they did 50 years ago. And since our food chain will go the way of Enron if bees stopped buzzing, it appears that the future of the human race hinges on their survival. So, that opens up two primary questions. What's actually causing the precipitous decline of bees? And what can we do to stop it? And I'm not going to answer that first question, because I can't. No one can, yet. We still don't fully understand colony collapse disorder. Scientists have some ideas, but it remains an unsolved mystery. Like why Game of Thrones Series 8 was so shit. Those ideas include climate change, pesticide usage, and the proliferation of mites, particularly the aptly named Varroa destructor, which infests hives and feeds on bee pupae. Now, you've probably noticed that climate change is messing up the timing of the seasons. And that's a problem, because many bees are very picky eaters, and they'll only feed on certain flowers that bloom at specific times of the year. If the bees wake up from their winter slumber and find there's no pollen to be had, they'll die. It's as simple as that. It's like walking home after a night out to find the only kebab shop in town is closed. You're going to do the only thing possible, sit on the pavement and die. Pesticides are also a big problem. In 2013, the European Union introduced a temporary ban on the use of neonicotinoids after they were found to be harming bees. Since then, the ban has been made permanent, and many other countries have followed suit. So, the bees are dying, and we still aren't completely sure why. What do we do? Well, humanity has a storied history of creating new technologies to get ourselves out of a pickle. When our cities grew too large and started to smell like shite, we invented sanitation and sewer systems. When population growth outpaced farming, we invented mechanized farming to meet the demand. And when everyone's limbs turned green and fell off, we discovered penicillin. And now we might need to pull yet another tech miracle out of humanity's last chance locker. I think we can all agree that the ideal solution to bee decline is to reverse the trend. But let's just imagine that we fail in this noble endeavor. In a last-ditch attempt to save our species, couldn't we simply replace all the bees with robot bees? Surfshark VPN keeps you safe and private by covering up everything you do online. 
and Surfshark VPN lets you travel the world virtually by changing your virtual location. Or whilst you are physically traveling, Surfshark also lets you connect via your home country so you don't miss out on all your home comforts, such as streaming video content from home that might be blocked whilst you're traveling. No matter where I am in the world, I always use Surfshark to watch my favorite content from back home. There are over 3,200 servers in 100 countries, so anywhere you go, you'll find a server that fits your needs. Surfshark VPN offers a multi-hub feature, so you can put two VPN servers between you and your online destination for even more privacy and security. And personally, I love Surfshark's IP rotator feature which constantly changes your device's IP address without losing your VPN connection. It's so important to stay safe online when you're out and about, and that's why I use Surfshark VPN. So I can, for example, access my online banking safely, even on public Wi-Fi. There's not a chance I would ever do that without a VPN. VPNs also keep your location and download history private, so you can send and receive files securely. Get an exclusive Black Friday deal. Enter promo code 42 to get up to six additional months for free at surfshark.deals slash 42. Don't miss out. And a big thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. As you can imagine, creating an autonomous pseudo-intelligent drone the size of a bee that seeks out flowers and forces them to have sex throws up countless challenges. Evolution has enjoyed a 3.5 billion year head start on us when it comes to developing the perfect pollinator. We, on the other hand, only started having a serious crack at it in 2009. So it's fair to say, we have some catching up to do. Growing up in the 21st century, you'll have no doubt witnessed humanity's struggle when it comes to creating robots that can effortlessly replicate the physical dynamics of humans and other animals. It's been difficult enough trying to build a robot that doesn't walk like it's pissed, let alone one that can convincingly shag a rose. And it's not like we haven't been trying either. The Japanese have made countless attempts at building a lifelike sex robot. <coughs> Sorry, I, I meant to say personal assistant. And the Americans have spent billions on robotic doggos that will probably enslave humanity. So it should come as no surprise that trying to replicate bee dynamics in a mechanical vehicle is really bloody difficult. In case you didn't know, bees are the flying aces of the animal world. They can hover, fly backwards, turn 90 degrees almost instantaneously, and can even fly in the rain, despite weighing 100 milligrams. If that doesn't impress you, just remember that the average human male can't even piss straight. Yet, with over two decades of R&D by the world's brightest minds, it's still proving difficult to replicate a bee's complex maneuvers. And then there's the massive issue of miniaturization. It's taken us half a century to go from room-sized computers to the smartphone that's beside you right now. Most honeybees and bumblebees, the most likely pollinators, are about one to two centimeters in length. To pack the sensors, actuators, computer chips, radio transmitters, and batteries a robotic bee would require into such a tiny form factor, given the typical dimensions of currently available components is, well, it's like trying to fit a Boeing 747 into a hamster's arse. But all this hasn't stopped some from trying. Building robotic bees, that is, not improbable hamster insertions. Most notably, the RoboBee project at Harvard University has been at the forefront of this ambitious endeavor. With a wingspan of just three centimeters, the RoboBee is a marvel of micro-robotics. The RoboBee project was not just about mimicking the flight of bees, but was also a general exploration of microscale engineering. Traditional methods of building robots, which involve rotary motors, gears, and nuts and bolts, were rendered obsolete at this scale. Instead, the team at Harvard had to innovate from scratch, developing a novel pop-up assembly process. This method, inspired by the simplicity and precision of pop-up books, means the RoboBee can be printed as a thin, multi-layered sheet of carbon, brass, and titanium, then simply popped up to create a 3D robot literally in seconds. The wings of the RoboBee are powered by artificial muscles. These are made from piezoelectric actuators. This smart material basically contracts when electricity is passed through it, exactly like a real muscle. Using these, the RoboBee can flap at an astounding 173 times per second. 
That's really nice, Harvard, but still a touch behind the honeybee with its 230 hertz wings. By the way, if you're wondering why it's so important to increase that number, the more flaps per second, the more stable it will be in flight, because on this scale, gusts of wind can easily carry the robot away. The RoboBee can also perch onto pretty much any surface at almost any angle using static electricity, similar to when you take the plastic film off a product and it sticks to your hands incessantly, and after two minutes of trying to awkwardly remove it, you genuinely consider chopping your limbs off because it would just be easier. However, the RoboBee still relies on an external tether for its power and decision-making, and putting these on board the robot at this scale is still a long way off. The Harvard team did strap tiny solar cells to the RoboBee to see if it could generate its own power on the fly from sunlight, but its flight was using up twice the power it could generate, so that's quite a deficit to overcome. Each RoboBee weighs just 259 milligrams, and in 2012, the Harvard team proudly watched as it made its very first untethered flight. However, it lasted for the grand total of one second before careening off. Still, it holds the record for the lightest machine to ever sustain self-powered flight. Since Harvard's beyond work, there have been many other projects that have popped up around the world, but they all face essentially the same problem. The required technology simply doesn't exist yet. Computer chips, although remarkably small, are still too big especially those that are required to run the advanced image recognition and AI models on board for flower recognition, navigation, and decision-making. And then there's the batteries. We've been using the same lithium-ion technology in consumer tech for decades now. Every industry is awaiting the invention of a new, lighter, longer-lasting battery. Realistically, we're probably at least a decade away from functional robotic bees. But they will come. Which leads me to my next question. Should they? Now, personally, I'm under the impression that we should mess about with nature as little as we can. Earlier, I said that evolution has a 3.5 billion year head start on us. And who are we to think that we know better about the delicate balance of unfathomably complex ecosystems? We have no idea how the real bees would react to robotic mini me suddenly rocking up on their flower patch. It might scare them away. They might see them as invaders and try to attack them. It could cause the bees to become stressed and less productive. Robo bees could be too successful and the technology could actually reduce the need for organic pollinators, causing them to become extinct even quicker. In trying to solve the problem, we could make it worse. Then there's the dystopian elephant in the room. I don't think I'm alone in looking at these things and instantly thinking, terrorism. I know that might sound alarmist, but what happens if rogue actors hack these robotic hives or develop their own robotic bees that can deliver a small payload of poison for hyper-targeted assassinations? Yeah, if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves right in the middle of a real-life Black Mirror episode. Of course, it's not all negatives. There are benefits to an artificial bee over the real deal. If the energy problem is solved, they would be more efficient than real bees, so they could work much longer hours. Robots aren't affected by disease, they can survive in extreme temperatures, and they don't need to hibernate. The robots could also collect data on the health of plants and small shifts in environmental conditions that might otherwise be missed. Essentially, we could use them to debug and optimize our environment, which is ironic because it's debugging of another kind that is landing us in this mess in the first place. On the flip side, there's also the rather scary scenarios that could emerge from tiny robotic insects with the power of mass surveillance and data collection, but I'll leave that to your imagination. I have to say, with all honesty, it's really impressive what the team at Harvard has achieved and will likely go on to achieve. But with all of this in mind, I'd like to propose another solution to our dwindling bee problem. Now, fair warning, this might sound a little out there, but bear with me, because it could catch on. Why don't we just save the fucking bees? Don't get me wrong, I love technology, and I especially love when humanity puts our minds together to create technology-led solutions to social, humanitarian, or environmental issues, because sometimes it's the only way out of a hot mess. But it seems a little bit odd to me that we're spending millions, and potentially billions, on the close to impossibly difficult task of replicating a creature that has evolved almost perfectly 
to keep our world pollinated. And if you take a look at the history of human inventions, we kind of have a bad track record of ballsing it up the first few times. I mean, in trying to perfect the flying machine, we ended up with the Hindenburg and then Ryanair. And that's not a journey we want to emulate again. Now, I appreciate that not everyone would agree with this, but one could argue that all this funding would be better spent on further research into why the bees are declining and remedial solutions. I'm not saying it's as simple as that because it really, really isn't. But is it just me that thinks by instead choosing to reinvent the bee wheel, it kind of feels like we're just giving up? I'm not trying to dismiss the development of the technology in its entirety though. After all, there are some genuinely positive use cases that could arise from it. Think robotic bees that can be utilized for search and rescue missions, research and exploration in dangerous or unreachable terrains, micro repairs on hard to reach parts of buildings such as skyscrapers, and robo bees could one day pollinate crops on the International Space Station and maybe inside a future Mars colony. So rather than coming across as a Luddite, all I'm trying to say is that most people, myself included, love bees. They're beautiful creatures. And I don't want to live in a world where our gardens, meadows and forests are filled with the sound of tiny mechanical drones. Personally, I'm more fond of the approach taken by a team at Durham University in the UK, who've launched the Robo Royale project that aims to create robotic bees not to pollinate but to provide care, specifically to care for the real-life queen of pre-existing beehives. Of the 20 to 30,000 bees that make up a single hive, the vast majority are pollinators. But then there's the queen's court, which consists of the queen and her worker bees. If she's in good health and in good spirits, she can lay up to 200,000 eggs per year. The queen's health has a trickle-down effect on the rest of the hive, affecting the efficiency and total number of pollinator bees. The Robo Royale project aims not to replace bees, but to create artificial support bees. Powered by advanced AI, they will live in the hive, acting as super worker bees, directly caring for the queen 24-7, such as feeding and grooming her, allowing the hive to reach its maximum potential Robo Royale is in its very early stages, but it offers a much less invasive approach to fixing the bee decline dilemma, and I think if implemented correctly, it could be the happy medium that bees and humanity needs. With everything I've said in mind, it's very easy for me to stand here and blame the ominous they for not doing enough to save our black and yellow warriors, but maybe we should all take it upon ourselves to do our part by planting more flowers, selectively rewilding parts of our gardens and communities, and buying local honey to support small-scale beekeepers. And who knows, maybe we'll discover that those elusive robotic bees we've been chasing have been amongst us all along. Thanks for watching. Just a quick word to say that I couldn't make these videos without the support of my Patreon members. Consider joining the exclusive 42 Discord community by supporting me on Patreon. It's a great place to discuss my videos with like-minded individuals and myself. The link's in the description, but if you don't want to, or you can't join my Patreon, then please don't worry. A simple like or comment to say thanks would also put a huge smile on my face. Thank you.